Hello, and welcome to a lecture on Receiver Gain, Sensitivity, and Selectivity. I'm Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, we'll talk about the specification of receiver gain, and I'll show you an example. We'll talk about the concept of pre-selection, and then finally we'll talk about selectivity. So first, receiver gain. The first question I want to pose is how low can the receiver gain be? Well, the purpose of receiver gain, which I will give the variable name G here, is to boost the received signal to a level which is suitable for digitization or analog detection, depending on whether we're using an A to D or an analog detector of some kind, like an envelope detector for AM. So this level that we deliver to the digitizer or the detector is a level which should yield acceptable signal to noise ratio, taking into account the limitations of that digitizer or detector. For digitizer, it's desirable to make the sensitivity of the receiver independent of the quantization signal to noise ratio and any other impairments that the digitizer may exhibit. For an ideal ADC, that is one which is impaired only by quantization and not by other effects, what we'd like is for the analog noise power spectral density, which is delivered to the digitizer by the receiver, to be greater than the worst case quantization noise power spectral density referred to the input of the digitizer. So the analog noise power spectral density delivered to the digitizer can be expressed as follows. K, that's Boltzmann's constant, times T sys, the system temperature, times the receiver gain, G, which I identified here. If you're murky on the concept of system temperature, please go back and review that concept in chapter 7. On the right-hand side here, the worst-case quantization noise power spectral density referred to the ADC input, well, that's the full-scale power of the ADC. In other words, the power level at which, or the power of the signal, which results in the maximum codable level some fraction of the time, divided by the quantization signal to noise ratio. And then to get a power spectral density, we realize that that quantization noise is distributed over one Nyquist zone. And a Nyquist zone has bandwidth of Fs divided by 2. So we divide by Fs by 2 to get a power spectral density. So this is an equation which tells us how to satisfy this condition. And that condition then gives us this property that the sensitivity of the receiver will be independent of the quantization signal noise ratio of the digitizer. Now note that even though I say greater than here, preferably we'd like it to be much, much greater than because again, we want to make this insensitive. We don't want to be right on the edge. We'd like to be well beyond that uh, threshold. Now, how about in the reverse direction? How high can the receiver gain be? How high should we try to set it? Well, the relevant condition to consider here is one in which the signal noise ratio is less than one regardless of the bandwidth considered. Let me give you two examples. In the first example, no signal present or just a very, very weak signal. Second example, signals which are deliberately very weak, such as GPS. In this case, what we're looking for is the analog noise power which is delivered to the digitizer to be less than the maximum analog power referred to the ADC input. In other words, we could apply enough gain that the noise power itself is actually at the maximum codable level. And we know then that the signal is not going to cause us to uh, clip or overload the ADC. So if we work this out, the analog noise power delivered to the ADC, K times T sys times bandwidth, that gives us total power now, times receiver gain, should be less than the full scale power of the A to D. And of course, we would prefer that to be much, much less than the full scale power of the ADC. So now we've established two bounds on the receiver gain, one uh, a lower bound and one an upper bound. Together, these conditions tell us how to set the gain in such a way that first preserves the sensitivity achieved by the analog section of the receiver that is, it's not spoiled by the characteristics of the ADC, and then secondly, prevents the signal from being corrupted by excessive clipping. 
We might not be able to meet both conditions simultaneously. We'll see an example of that later. And this will lead us to the concept of automatic gain control. In other words, there may be no single constant value of receiver gain that gets the job done. And then we'll have to vary the gain automatically. And keep in mind that many assumptions are built into these expressions. So, an example. In this example, the environment contributes 300 Kelvin of noise. And this is then the antenna temperature. So let me draw a picture. So here's an antenna and it is contributing a temperature, a noise temperature 300 Kelvin. And then we have a receiver. And this receiver can be described as a single block here, having a noise figure of 6 dB, having a bandwidth of 1 megahertz, and then we can have a analog to digital converter. And the sample rate of the analog to digital converter is 10 mega samples per second. It has a number of bits, which is 12, outputs 12 bits. And full scale power is plus 10 dBm. So can we suggest in this case a reasonable value or reasonable range for the receiver gain G? So this is really the question we're asking here. What should gain of this receiver block in front of the ADC be? Or what's a reasonable range? Well, first, it's useful to know the total input referred equivalent noise temperature. And we can write that as TSIS as the sum of the intended temperature and the receiver noise temperature. We just said the antenna temperature is 300 Kelvin. We can work out the receiver temperature from the stated noise figure. And the result is 1,164 Kelvin. That would be the system temperature. We can also work out the quantization signal to noise ratio and the worst case quantization noise power. QSNR is approximately six times the number of bits based on a number of assumptions, which I've discussed in a previous lecture or previous lectures. So a good guess at the quantization signal noise ratio is 72 dB. And we know this could be accurate to within a few dB. Therefore, the maximum encodable power divided by the quantization signal noise ratio will be minus 62 dBm. Therefore, I can work out this bound that we established just a few slides back. And I find that the gain should be greater than 38.9 dB. So gain greater than 38.9 dB satisfies this bound. Here's the other bound. And uh, if I work out a gain based on that bound, I find that the gain should be less than 118 dB or so. So here is the range of reasonable gains in this particular scenario based on the bounds that I've worked out. Now, if possible, we would rather bury the quantization noise. And by that, I mean we'd rather that the external noise be greater than the quantization noise. So typically, we'd like to increase the minimum gain by about 10 dB. So this is merely greater than. If we want to make it much, much greater than, then we raise that by 10 dB. So something like 50 dB would be a more reasonable amount of gain in this problem. And we definitely need headroom to accommodate unexpectedly high noise levels without clipping. So for that reason, we probably don't want the gain to actually get to 118 dB or so. We want to back that off. So if we back that off by 10 dB, then we get 108 dB. So a more practical range of values would be something like 50 dB to 108 dB. And by the way, one finds in almost all receiver designs that the gain ends up being in this range. Let's talk about gain in mobile radio environments. In the previous example, we completely neglected the possibility that the signal strength may vary as a function of time. Yet we know that in narrowband VHF UHF radio systems, which by the way account for most radio systems, including cellular systems, that there's tremendous variation in signal level. For example, 40 dB variation due to range. In other words, if you assume path loss varies as R to the fourth, which is a typical assumption in land mobile radio and cellular systems, 
and you assume that the range between the receiver and transmitter varies by a factor of 10 to 1 or so, which might be typical in these systems, then you end up with 40 dB variation just due to range. You get another 25 dB variation due to fast fading, and this is the tendency of the signal to go up and down very quickly because of local scattering, local multipath. So if you add these two up, we expect something like 65 dB total variation, and that's happening very quickly. Now the flexibility in setting gain has melted away because we have 65 dB of variation possible. So look what happens if we try to set the fixed gain in the previous example. So if we start off with 38.9 dB required to make the analog noise equal to the ADC contributed power, and we throw in a 10 dB margin, as we indicated would be useful, then we get about 50 dB recommended minimum gain. So 50 dB minimum gain just to get started. Well, on top of that, we have 65 dB variation in signal power. So some fraction of the time, this will be the right solution. But there will be times when we'll need another 65 dB of gain to cover this whole range. 40 dB due to path loss, 25 dB due to fading, and this is varying dynamically. So if we just account for this, we get 115 dB. Well, we indicated that the absolute maximum would be something like 118 dB. So the difference between these two is only 3 dB. That's all that's left for ADC headroom. So this solution for fixed gain of about 50 dB is pretty tight. And this is a motivation for AGC. In other words, typically we don't want to just have a 50 dB set to gain. We'd like to allow, come up with some system so the receiver gain can vary in proportion to the uh, signal losses that we see occurring associated with propagation. Next topic, pre-selection. Filtering in a receiver occurs at a number of places, but when we talk about pre-selection, we're talking about filtering that occurs at or near the input to a receiver. And the intent in pre-selection is to suppress signals or entire bands of frequencies which are not of interest. So if we have some particular band that we're interested in or some particular signal that we know we're always going to be tuned to, other signals are not of interest and we should really do something to get rid of them so they don't create problems in the receiver, either as mixing products or as sources of spurious or things which limit our sensitivity or linearity. So pre-selection is all about suppressing signals which are likely to be harmful. For example, as I just stated, signals strong enough to create significant spurious through nonlinear mechanisms, and in particular, image band signals. We talked about this when we talked about frequency conversion. So all these things are calling for filtering, and filtering at or near the input of the receiver, and we refer to that as pre-selection. Usually some form of pre-selection is required because most of the spectrum is cluttered with signals. Pre-selection improves linearity and reduces vulnerability to problems related to frequency conversion, in particular image band interference. So let me give you an example here, the color dot LMR receiver. So the color dot band refers to a band of frequencies, as you see here, 151 to 154 megahertz, consisting of two-way radios, which are used, for example, by um, uh, taxi dispatch, they're used for uh, local security uh, companies, uh, like uh, watchmen, security guards. They're used in uh, a large number of applications where people are using um, walkie-talkie-like communications. And the color dot scheme refers to a scheme in which radio frequencies are assigned colors to make it easy for people to know what frequencies various radios are on. So if you see a radio with a blue dot, you know it can communicate with the radio with another blue dot because they're using the same frequency. In any event, the color dot band goes from 151 to 154 megahertz, and there's relatively weak signals above and below that band, but there are some very strong signals when we get further out. For example, the FM broadcast band is very strong, and it exists at frequencies up to 108 megahertz. And also the TV VHF high band is very strong. That exists at frequencies as low as 174 megahertz. 
So the pre-selection for a color dot land mobile radio receiver should exhibit a pass band, of course, over the color dot band, and it should provide stop bands where there are strong interfering signals, in particular if the image bands are out there. And then, of course, we have to transition from one to the other. We can't have brick wall response. So this is known as fixed pre-selection. The pre-selector is designed once, and it has these features, and it doesn't vary. And note that I have not explicitly accounted for image rejection requirements. So for example, if you have an image band that exists here, then you would need to account for that in the requirement for the pre-selection filter. Here's an example, pre-selection in TV receivers. So these are receivers for broadcast TV, and the question is, how would you design a pre-selector? It's particularly challenging because the TV band or TV signals exist in many bands. In North America, broadcast TV consists of several bands, and these bands contain channels which are 6 megahertz wide. So a single TV channel, 6 megahertz wide, and they're arranged into groups. There are three particular groups. The first group is called VHF Low. That goes from 54 megahertz to 88 megahertz. They're referred to as channels 2 through 6. Those are the just identification numbers assigned to those channels in this band. And I should also point out that 72 to 78 megahertz is not used for TV. It's a gap. It's used for other things. The second band is called VHF High. It goes from 174 to 210 megahertz, also known as channels 7 through 13. Finally, we have the UHF band. It goes from 470 megahertz to 698 megahertz. And these are known as channels 14 through 51. So this is what a pre-selector in a TV receiver, a modern TV receiver, would look like. Coming from the antenna, we would typically break it up into three bands because we have three groups of frequencies and there's no need to, to allow other frequencies to make it to the receiver, the rest of the receiver. So these three bands are represented here, the VHF low, VHF high, and UHF bands. And we would typically do that breaking up of the bands using a multiplexer. And we could also do that with a switched input filter bank. Then recall within each band, we're interested in only one six megahertz channel. Now we've got a whole chunk of six megahertz channels even after this additional division uh, into bands. So typically what's done here is we have a thing called a tracking filter. And a tracking filter is simply a filter, which is band pass but whose center frequency can be varied. So the bandwidth of this filter would be six megahertz for one channel, and it could be tuned and similarly here and similarly here. And then somewhere else in the receiver, we would select one of these three outputs. Very common scheme for pre-selection in modern TV receivers. Now you might ask the question, why not just use one tracking filter? In other words, why not just have antenna tracking filter, and then output. Seems like that would be a lot simpler. The answer to that question has to do with the difficulty in designing filters. Note here, the tuning range is 13 to 1. A tracking filter implemented like this would have to tune continuously from 58 to 698 megahertz. That's a range of 13 to 1. That's an extraordinarily difficult filter to design. Uh, that is a filter that's 6 megahertz wide and tunes continuously over a 13 to 1 range. It's far easier to break that up into bands and then have these three tracking filters which have to tune over a much narrower bandwidth. So this filter only has to tune 1.6 to 1, 1.2 to 1, 1.5 to 1. So these tracking filters are way easier to implement. Selectivity. This is the ability of a receiver to prevent signals at nearby frequencies from interfering with the processing of the intended signal. Pre-selection is one element of the selectivity of a receiver. Image rejection, possibly combined into the pre-selector, is another element. Post-mixer filtering plays a role by suppressing spurious mixer-generated output, but not by suppressing undesired multiplication products. Selectivity is usually determined primarily by a filter late in the signal chain. 
especially in frequency down conversion systems in which the fractional bandwidth is larger, that is easier, in the later stages. Now the counter example of course is the pre TV pre-selector I just showed, but in most receivers what happens is we actually set the selectivity in, our, in an intermediate frequency stage. And we'll show examples of that in a future lecture. This concludes this lecture on receiver gain, sensitivity, and selectivity.